For more interviews on educational technology and for a list of our educational technology workshops, including those with Will Richardson, please visit www.edtechlive.com. To join in the discussion on School 2.0, please visit www.school20.net. I think that that connection and that ability to really publish easily through a blog and to find other people and and to begin linking to those other people through a blog is really powerful and can do a lot for professional practice as well as for what happens in the classroom. Content is changing very quickly. Uh, ideas are changing. Technologies are changing. It's just going to be so much more important that we have kids who know how to learn, who are flexible and creative. Um, than it is kids who can, you know, uh, spew out answers to test questions. If we, as a public school system, don't start drastically rethinking what we do, uh, there are going to be many, many alternatives for kids that are going to be cropping up in the next five to ten years that are going to allow them to opt out of public school and public school education as we know it. But we have no idea what that future looks like. We don't even know what the future is going to look like necessarily, you know, five years from now, ten years from now. So the only thing we can do is prepare our kids to be ready for anything. Um, you know, and, and to me that says, well, they need to know how to build their own learning communities. They need to know how to find their own trusted sources of information. They need to know how to network their ideas. Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and it's Friday, December 29th, 2006, and my guest today is Will Richardson. Hi, Will. Hey, Steve. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. Got uh, through the holiday and uh, now looking forward to the new year. You, you've been on a little bit of a break, I think, right? Yep. I'm in the middle of, uh, of about seven weeks at home, which has been really nice. Um, just uh, time to really kind of catch up with my kids and my wife and uh, get some stuff done around the house and, and just kind of relax for a little bit and uh, uh, get some rest. I'm sure it's well deserved. <laughs> Thanks. Will, why should teachers look at blogging? Well, I think uh, the, the immediate answer is uh, because it gives their students a way to publish and gives them a way to publish as well, but um, it gives their, their students, I think, the power to begin creating work for larger audiences that are in the classroom. I think that's kind of the, the easy answer um, uh, if you believe, as I do, that giving kids opportunities to uh, have their work be seen by other people outside of schools, uh, by people they don't know, by people who are interested in the topics that they're writing about, that that can be a pretty uh, powerful motivator, number one, but also uh, I think a really effective way of, of helping kids learn um, because of the feedback that they get, because of the interactions that might grow from that. Then I think that's a great reason to consider blogs um, and podcasts and some of these other tools. I don't think it's just simply limited to blogs. I, I think the, uh, the more complex reason or the, the kind of more uh, personal reason for teachers to start looking at blogs is because of the potential, at least, to become a part of a real connected network of learners, uh, to, to build or to become a part of a community of people who are pretty much connecting and engaging in ideas about things that they're all passionate about. And, and I think that's the big difference um, that that these tools have had in my life, obviously, and, and uh, I think in many other teachers who, with many other educators that you talk to, I think that they'll tell you basically the same thing. It's been a way to really connect to people of similar thoughts and similar passions. And when you get into an environment like that, whether it's face-to-face -face or whether it's virtual, some amazing things can happen, and that's, I think, where the transformation comes. Uh, you just get very... Uh, motivated, at least I was, and I, I still am very motivated to to uh, be a part of this conversation, to to learn from all these people, to be teacher at some points, to be learner at other points, um, and uh, I, I think that that connection and that ability to really publish easily through a blog and to find other people and and to begin linking to those other people through a blog 
is really powerful and can do a lot for professional practice as well as for what happens in the classroom. So, Will, tell us a little bit about your uh, your personal experience with blogs and, and what you were doing at the time professionally. Well, I was a classroom teacher. I uh, had been in the classroom for about 18 years when, uh, it's back in 2001, when uh, I, I was uh, using the web a lot uh, as a journalism major. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of an info junkie, so the web was just, you know, a, a real great uh, tool for me. Um, and it was something that as soon as, as the web came out in 94, 95, I mean, I was hooked. I was doing a lot of uh, professional development type things around the Internet in, in 95 and, and uh, using it in my classroom pretty extensively as soon as we got it. So um, I was already on the web a lot, but then when, when I found a blog, and it, it ended up being a site called Metafilter, um, that uh, I didn't really know what it was, but as soon as I figured out what it was, and as soon as then I started reading about what blogs were, um, I, I started one at Blogger and, and just became hooked almost instantly. Um, and it wasn't so much that uh, there was a, an immediate connection to other people, but uh, there was this idea, just this concept, that I could start publishing very easily. And as a kind of a frustrated journalist, I think that's what really keyed it in for me. Um, you know, here was a way that I could publish and, and have my ideas out there. And I didn't know if people were reading me or not. Um, but pretty early on, I, I started thinking about the potential of this for my journalism students as well. And um, again, I think it was in probably May, April or May of 2001 that I started blogging. And that fall, I brought blogs into my classroom. I uh, set up all my journalists with uh, blogger accounts, and uh, we had a class blog, and we started kind of experimenting with, uh, you know, posting our writing and, and getting people to interact. So um, that led me to start looking for other educators out there who may have been thinking about this as well. And, and seriously, back then there were probably only about, uh, you know, five or six people on the K-12 level that I could find. Pat Delaney in San Francisco, who was a librarian at Galileo High School out there, and um, there were a couple other people who were uh, in colleges, um, and uh, uh, so you know I started kind of uh, reading their blogs. They were reading mine. We were commenting back and forth, and I didn't really think too much about that whole piece of it. I mean, I knew that there were other people who were entering the conversation and, and kind of becoming a part of of the whole community that we were building. But it seemed you know like it was moving pretty slowly. Um, through the first two or three years of it. But then I think it was, you know, 2003, 2004, all of a sudden something, I don't know exactly what it was, but something started to happen um, in terms of uh, the reach of my ideas on my blog. There suddenly became a, a number of people who were interested in the things that I was writing about, again, because I think I was one of the very few classroom teachers who at that point had actually implemented these tools I was using them by that time with my literature classes and you know basically every class I taught we were doing blogging of some type or another and um, as the tool started to become a little more well known and people started thinking seeing seeing how they were impacting uh, you know business and, and media and, and uh, other entities outside of education there were a few reporters who all of a sudden started saying well I wonder you know what's going on in education, and when they looked, I mean, there again, there were only a handful of us that they were able to find. So, I mean, I was really fortunate, and then I got some notice, and you know, some some newspapers like the New York Times and the the, the Wall Street Journal, and 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 at that point, you know, then the community really started growing, and in the last two years, it's just been an amazing kind of uh, spike and the number of teachers and the number of educators who are who are writing and and blogging about their own uh, ideas and and uh what they're doing in the classroom and it's gotten to the point where I really felt like up until about a year or a year and a half ago I could keep track of it but <laughs> now it's just you know it's just there's just so many people who are doing it that it's great you know and and the conversation has just really exploded and so what what happened for me personally through that time was you know, I hooked up with some really interesting teachers. I found some very interesting people online who were blogging, and I read their blogs religiously, and I and I commented, and and they would come and comment on my blog. And um, before I knew it, uh, there were probably about 20 or 30 people who I was 
interacting with on a fairly regular basis and uh, and just getting some great ideas from. And and I realized pretty early that that's just something that could not have happened in in face to face space. You know, I mean, there just there was no one out here, uh, and no one at my school who even knew what a blog was. No one who really had uh, an inclination to begin to use uh, blogs or those types of tools in the classroom. Uh, no one who really you know uh, had a pull for publishing like I did. So again, to be able to connect with those people. Um, gave me my own kind of professional development community. Uh, there's a lot of educators that talk about it that way now, I think, too, that this is their professional development, you know, and that they can really focus it. And uh, in doing that, it just it became transformative to me. I, I started learning and I started writing and, and interacting in ways that I had never done before. Um, I was learning things that were totally relevant to me. I had choices about the things that I was learning about. It wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't like a prescribed curriculum, and and so it became very, very uh, uh, engaging and motivating to me. And it, and like I said before, it still is. I mean, it's just I look back on the last five, six years now, and I just am amazed at the difference in not only who I am as a learner. Uh, and who I am as an educator, but who I am as a person too. I mean, my life has has changed a lot, obviously, because of the use of those tools. But nowhere has it changed more than just in the ability to learn the things that I'm passionate about from a bunch of people who I who I really trust and respect, and and look to uh, for answers, and and you know look to as teachers. Well, you've described this professional development community that that uh, comes from actively participating as an educational blogger. What did you have your students do, and did they have similar experiences? Were you able to, to take the transformative experiences that you were having as a teacher and, and invite them into similarly transformative experiences? Um, I, I think that the, the probably the general answer to that is no. Uh, I, I don't think that... Uh, I. I where I was teaching at the time, I had nine-week classes, so I was with them uh, for a fairly short period of time, and you know, obviously had a curriculum that I had to cover. Um, what I, I, I was hoping to do was at least, and, and when I first started doing this, obviously, I didn't really understand what was happening in, in my own life either. I mean, I, I knew that I was getting ideas and, and finding people and having conversations from people around the world, and that was really interesting and cool, but I don't think I realized the depth to which it was. Um, just changing my practice. Um, so what I was hoping to do with my students, at least, is to is to expose them to this opportunity. And what what I did was, as much as possible, was to connect them to uh, either other journalists or authors or uh, experts, some type that they could begin to have conversations with through their blogs that would allow them to get some different perspective or to to give them some different learning than than what I could provide and with the hopes that they would begin to build their own networks, you know, their own kind of uh their learning um their learning communities. Um in the end, I don't think 9 weeks was enough time to really nurture that and sustain it. And so I mean, I still hear from some of my former students who are bloggers and who who made that leap, you know, who kind of kept at it and and uh, put the time into it in order to become a part of communities like that. But I would say by and large, uh, the kids that were in my classes had, it, I think, an interesting experience with the tools, but I don't know that they adopted them and had a transformative experience the way I have now. Have you since seen situations where blogging has been used in the classroom in a way that really does transform the students? Um, yeah, and you know, transform, I guess, is relative, right? I, I mean, when I think of it, I, I, when I think of it in my own experience, I kind of look at that word and think that it is huge, big changes, you know, that it has left me a, a radically different type of learner from the way that I was. Um, but I think transformative can can also be on used you know on a smaller scale and I, and and I think that uh, uh, I've had just in my own experience I've had a number of students come up to me 
um, and and just say you know that that there were moments when they talked to people outside of the class when they had real conversations, real experiences that were not contrived for classroom purposes, you know, which which so much of education is, unfortunately. Um, that in those moments, the, their eyes were opened to, to the real potential of, of, you know, what's going on outside. And that there's small transformations that happen like that. Um, but, you know, I, I think that's a great question. And, uh, and, I, and I'm not sure that there are a lot of examples of student learning being transformed by blogging or um, a lot of these tools in the ways that we would like to see them happen, you know, and maybe the ways that they've happened to us or to me. Um, and that may be asking a lot, you know. Um, and, and, and I think that, uh, that there are more and more examples now. I, I really feel like we're maturing in the sense that uh, there seem to be more examples now where it's not just kind of a online portfolio. It's not just kind of a um, uh, portal for a class, you know, where, where blogs and classrooms are really starting to be used as places for students to, to think critically and to read critically and to link. I mean, I, I, get, I get some pushback on this. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I get some pushback on this a lot because I, I think I have a very narrow definition of what blogging is, you know, that, that it, for it to be a real learning tool, that there has to be some reading involved, there has to be some reader response, there has to be some, some connections that are made, some synthesis of ideas. That there, You have to expend a little intellectual sweat in order to really get the benefit of you know, putting your ideas out there and then having, hopefully having people start to interact with them. And that's not something that I do, I, I do see a lot of yet, uh, especially in the K through 12 level. In the college level, I see a lot of it. I, I've seen more, many, many more examples of teachers who have been willing to, you know, let their kids write about the things that they're passionate about, and in doing so, build connections around it. Um, and that's very cool. But on the K-12 level, that seems to be a much more difficult thing for teachers to be able to do. Um, it's happening in, in some places, but it's, it's certainly not happening uh, to the extent that uh, that I would just personally like to see it happen. So we had our daughter's eighth grade teacher over for dinner last night, and she expressed an interest in blogging and having her students start to blog. What advice would you give her? What's a good place for her to start? Well, I think that <clears throat> the thing that, that I tell people when they, and that, that question does come up, Quite a bit, you know. How do I how do I get started in this? Because there's so much, and it it can seem overwhelming. I'm sure. I think the place to start is to simply start to read and to interact with some of the bloggers who are out there who are aligned with whatever passions you have. I mean, um, if if your daughter's uh, teacher is is someone who really wants to investigate the uses of technology as you know in different pedagogies and and different different ways in the classroom, then certainly um, there are a lot of bloggers out there who are writing about that that probably would be good to read for, you know, a few weeks at least, I would think, uh, just to kind of get a sense of what the conversation is and how the conversations go. But even if that's not the interest, even if it's, uh, you know, sports or if it's cooking or knitting or, or whatever, I mean, there are bloggers of, of just about every stripe out there that are, are doing some interesting things and, and teaching, you know, and, and building networks. So I, I, I think that the first step, the one thing I, I say to people, the first step is to just start reading. And, and when you feel comfortable to start interacting, um, to leave comments, you know, and, and to... Uh, to get a sense of, of what it's like to become a part of a conversation around whatever it is that's being written about. Um, and, and actually, that's why in, in a lot of the workshops that I do now, I, I really start with RSS I, rather than blogs. Um, and RSS, you know, is, is, a, is that technology that allows you to subscribe to what other people are writing on their blogs so you don't have to go keep checking up on, on what's new there. And, uh, if you can if you can set it up so that you have you know five or maybe ten different bloggers or different sources of information that you are collecting via RSS on a regular basis, the reading becomes pretty easy. 
um, it's just a matter of carving out a little bit of time and, and you know, being willing to, to make that a part of your daily practice. Um, and so I, I think the reading is the most important part. And then, you know, if you feel comfortable with the reading and you feel comfortable with, with putting your ideas out there, then uh, there's lots of different places to start blogging. Um, and obviously the two that most often are mentioned in, in our community, at least, I think, are Blogger and uh, edublogs.org. Um, both uh, have fairly easy interfaces that uh, you know allow people to to get up and running very quickly. Uh, Vox is another one that uh, the people who created Movable Pipe have just put out, and it's more actually of a of a social uh, networking site that has a pretty good blog tool uh, built into it that has a lot of different levels of privacy, which is is kind of unique. So. Um, I mean, it's it's definitely a process, you know. It's 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 also, I think, understanding from a contextual level the types of changes that these technologies are bringing about, and understanding from a student perspective what those social, what these social software tools do or can do. Because uh, I think the connections again that you can make around these tools are very different from the way that we look at education and traditional education and, and traditional practice, actually. So, you know, reading is a start, I think. Uh, and and uh, once you read, then you have things to blog about, you know. How many blogs do you read? Well, you know, it's it's another interesting question and, and one that I'm kind of, you know, it's the end of the year and I'm, I'm kind of looking, trying to be really reflective on my practice at this point and, and try to set some goals for myself for next year. And um, I, I found that over the last six months, I have really whittled down the number of sources that I read. Um, there were, at some point, I, I had probably about 120 or so different sources of information that I tried to track on a fairly regular basis. Most of them, probably, you know, like 60, 70 percent of them being practitioners being teachers in the classroom or, uh, you know, educators, uh, administrators, whatever, people who are in education who are talking about the use of these tools. But <clears throat> I'm finding on a couple of different levels that uh, I think I need to, to really focus uh, my reading and also to kind of expand it too. So what I mean by that is what I've done is I, I've pretty much pared down my reading list in the education circles to probably about 20 people at this point, 20 to 25 people. And um, those are people who, are, uh, who I've come to think of as uh, very trusted sources of information, people I've been reading, most of them I've been reading for quite a while and who I think are extremely good filters of, of uh, what's happening out there so that if there are, are really interesting ideas, really interesting posts that are being that, that people are creating, that they will kind of you know kind of float up through those filters to me. I don't want to miss you know the good stuff that's happening out there, obviously, but um, I can't. Uh, it's just my life has gotten to the point now where it's it's very difficult for me to keep up with that many sources of information. So, um, and on the other hand what I've been trying to do is I've been trying to think about ways to expand the scope of what I read. Um, I think that uh, I've become a little too uh, edu-centric, if that's the word, um, that uh, I'm not getting enough information outside of this community or an, an enough perspectives outside of the community. So uh, I'm trying to think of ways that I can kind of reach out into uh, other uh, other to other people, to other ideas, and and to uh, to bring that kind of conversation in as well. And, and I'm really kind of experimenting doing that with searches, uh, with RSS feeds to searches for particular terms or particular um, you know uh, keywords or tags or whatever else to bring me uh, that kind of reading as well. So it may not be one particular person as much as it is an idea that I kind of track or follow. Um, and uh, so, you know, we'll see how that goes. But uh, I think probably at the end of the day, it's going to end up being somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 or 50 different sources that I'll try to keep track of as I, as I you know, go through my days. Do you know how many people are reading your blog? 
Um, I don't. Uh, it's it's hard to. It's I find it. If anyone has a, a method to to try to get a fairly accurate number, um, I would love to hear it. But uh, you know, I look at blog lines, which is the biggest uh, or one of the one of the biggest RSS readers uh, out there, and there are somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,500 people who are subscribed to to my feed. So. Which is a fairly, I mean, it's a pretty nice number, obviously, of, of people. I don't know how many how many of those are actively reading that what comes into their aggregators, but I mean, I, I would guess that it's probably somewhere between five and ten thousand people who, um, I mean, I can look at the stats on my site, which uh, show somewhere in the neighborhood of, uh, you know, half a million unique visitors a year, but uh, I don't know. How many of those are real people? You know, that's that's the the thing that gets very difficult, I think, to do is to figure out exactly how many of those are really people who are looking at at what you're writing. So, um, I know that it's a fairly substantial number. Uh, I feel extremely privileged to have that many people reading, um, and I hope that I can sustain that. But, you know, in terms of a of an exact number, it's very difficult. If someone's starting out blogging. Should they feel pressure to blog in a certain way or regularly, or are there are there any pieces of advice that you would give someone? Well, I think you know a lot of people say they come up and say, "Well, you know, this is all great, but I don't really have that much to say. You know, I don't really have that much to talk about or to write about." And and I always go back to, "Well, if you're reading." You know, if, you, if you're reading what other people are saying and writing, and, and you're trying to take their ideas and, and put them into your own through your own lens and see how they apply to your own practice or to your own life, then those are that's great fodder for writing on a blog. You know that that uh, you know Steve Hargadon said this, and here's kind of what I think about that, and um, you know this is how that that plays out in my own experience and just kind of sharing that back to whoever might be reading what you had to say. So, um, you know, I, I think that there's a, a healthy mix of, of uh, personal experiences, of reading, of just kind of, uh, you know, uh, fun stuff that, that I try to put into my blog. And I'm not saying that that's the recipe for success for everyone. You know, everyone's got to do it their own way. But, uh, again, at the end of the day, I think to really get, the potential benefit of um, of what blogs can offer that there has to be some real thinking that shows up in there, and that those thoughts are being connected to other bloggers, other people, other sources, whatever. Uh, and then it's not just um, you know a journal or a diary, which is how a lot of people refer to blogs. Uh, there's nothing wrong, inherently wrong, with doing that, with with keeping a journal. But I don't think that if you're if you're just going to write about you know the things that happen to you during the day, that that um, leverages what you can do with a blog. Blogging is about networking, and the way you network is you link and you you know you write about again what other people are saying, and you you try to make connections in that way. But for some reasonable period of time. As a new blogger, I can probably expect that nobody's really going to be reading what I write. I think you've called that speaking to the empty room. Yeah, um, and and that's probably true in most cases, but it's not true in every case. I mean, I, I did a workshop, really funny, I mean, uh, that, that this happened, but I did a workshop uh, in New York State this summer where we literally had, had set up blogs five minutes ago, you know, five minutes uh and since this one teacher created a blog on Blogger, and she had a comment on her site, and and it was a real comment. I mean, she had she had, her first post on her blog was something to the effect of, "I'm looking for really good titles to teach in my eighth grade English class." You know, I'm just wondering if anyone has anything that they might suggest. She kind of put it up there just to write something, and within five minutes, there was a a response from someone somewhere who gave three titles. And we were all amazed, you know, I mean, we were all kind of going, oh, my God, how did that happen? And we figured out that probably how it happened was that on Blogger, there's a little scrolling, you know, uh, thing on the homepage that has the newest posts. And so every, you know, couple seconds, that title flips to something else. And probably someone just happened to be looking at Blogger at that moment 
clicked on that particular link and came to her blog, read it, and had something to to uh, offer. So, um, yeah, you know, you, odds are you're probably going to be writing to a very small audience, but uh, but you never know. And and I think that's what the interesting thing about this is is that you don't know. You don't know how many people are reading. Um, and and in many cases, I think just the potential of other people reading is very motivating. Uh, and certainly, there are ways to uh, to get people to read. You know, certainly the the most obvious and the one that I suggest to people all the time is that when you're reading something that you end up writing about on your blog, that you go back to that original source and in the comments say, "Hey, I really found these ideas interesting, and I wrote about them on my blog. Here's a link." <laughs> you know, and and that that will bring people back to your site. So the more active you can be or the more engaging you can be in conversations on other sites, the more that that will drive traffic you know, to your site if audience is what you're really looking for. But, um, and, and you should be looking for audience. I mean, I, I think that that's part of the reason that you do this. Um, you should be looking for potential teachers. I, I kind of say it that way because I, I I'd like the idea that our students should be clickable. Because if they're clickable, if someone can click on something that they've written or something that they've produced, to me, that's a potential teacher that, that is available to them at that point. And that those teachers that are potentially out there will never find them if our students are not clickable, if they're not findable in some way. So um, you know, I, I do think that that audience piece of it is, is really important. That, that whole kind of scenario plays out for us too as educators. That, there are millions of potential teachers for us out there too, um, and we have to be out there, uh, uh, willing to uh, put ourselves out there to find them. So I would imagine that that school administrators or or district level decision makers, when they hear that you want to make the student clickable, alarm bells have to go off in their heads. You know, how do we how how can we possibly do that without exposing the students to to danger. How do you respond to that? Well, I, I, I respond to it in two ways. Number one, I think many, not all certainly, but many of our students already are clickable. Um, but they're not clickable in a school environment. They're clickable out there on MySpace or on YouTube or wherever, it else, wherever else it is that they are producing content and they are sharing content pretty widely. Um, which personally I think is a great thing. I think that uh, um, the more that we can encourage that, I think the better, as long as we do it obviously and, and we, we uh, make sure kids know how to do it in safe ways. So the first part of it is, look, uh, this may scare you, but it's already happening. And it is pretty much the way of the world and how things are going to continue to evolve. I don't think, you know, I, again, I think this conversation has matured to the point where there's, there's not too much doubt that the future here is collaborative and more open and more transparent in terms of, of learning and in terms of education. So the reality of it is, is that it's already happening for our kids. <clears throat> the second piece of it I say is, look, you know, we can do this safely. There are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of kids around the world working with teachers who are blogging, who are podcasting, who are creating content in, in safe ways. Um, and that it is an education, not a technology uh, process that we have to go through, right? That, that sure, we have to make sure that they understand how to manipulate the tools, but to be honest with you, that's not real difficult for most people these days. But that we, what we really have to teach them is how to do it safely and how to do it in a way that really leverages the potential of the social tools that are out there. Now, that's a bigger conversation, I think, and a more difficult conversation for a lot of educators to have because it is so different from the traditional you know, kind of traditional ideas of what education should be. Um, education is not inherently collaborative as we see it. It is not inherently social as we see it. Um, and yet when kids leave us, that's the way they're learning. So <clears throat> from a relevant standpoint, I think it's imperative that our kids become clickable. And from a safety standpoint, I think it's imperative that we teach them how to be clickable because we're the ones that can keep them safe. We're the ones that can give them the tools to make the good decision, 
to keep themselves uh, and their privacy safe. Now, are there going to be instances where you know bad things are going to be happen are going to are going to happen? Absolutely. I mean, that is the reality of the world. I mean, I have a you know a seven and a nine year old too. You know, I have little kids too, and 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 we have conversations with them all the time about. Um, what do you do when this particular thing occurs, or what if this happens? You know, and, and uh, obviously at that age we don't get very explicit with them, but we're we're already trying to teach them that there are going to be times when you are going to be faced with a decision to make about what happens on screen, whether it's someone contacts you or you see something or whatever else, and that you at that point have to have the experience and have to have the context at least. To make a good decision about that, um, you know, and you know, there's a lot of kind of comparisons that we use when we talk about this. But the one I I think works really well is, you know, we don't teach kids how to drive a car by putting them just, you know, by just talking about what a car is like to drive and then giving them the keys one day and and say, here, go take your test. I mean, we put them in a car, we te- we we take them out on the road, we sit next to them. And we teach them how to do it. Driving is an extremely dangerous thing if you don't know what you're doing. But so we teach them. We teach them how to do it. Why shouldn't it be the same for for the web and, and for the Internet, tools that are are going to be, if not already, an extremely important part of their lives? So um, I, I think the case can be made. Um, but it's not something that is an easy sell necessarily. And it does take time, and it does it does, I think, uh, require that there are lots of conversation on, conversations on lots of different levels, not only about safety, but about again what's happening in the larger scheme of things from from a uh, from a learning standpoint. You know that things are changing, um, and uh, you know I think that I think that more and more people are starting to have those conversations. It does it does seem as though some of these things have happened very rapidly, and that it may take some time for those changes to take place. At least in our area, if anything, the restrictions on the use of the Internet are actually getting greater in our local school districts. Yeah, and that's, I, I don't think that that's uncommon. Um, but I, I do think, however, that there are uh, more and more instances or more and more examples, at least, of of places where conversations are being started, they may be blocking it, but at least they're 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 getting enough push now. I think that that uh, at least in a lot of schools with teachers that I talk to, you know, as I go do presentations and workshops, um, that there are, are are people who are willing to begin talking about what we should do. That it's they. I think they realize that blocking and filtering is not the ultimate answer. It's the short-term stopgap measure to kind of protect themselves. But that at the end of the day, they know they're going to have to come up with a different solution. Um, and uh, I just think that you're right. I think that's going to take some time. I think that's. I don't think that's going to be a very fast process. But I do think that that is a process that's going to start happening more and more as schools start to feel more and more left behind and more and more irrelevant, um, which, again, is what I think a lot of people or are, are, are a lot of places are starting to experience. Could you describe your vision of, of how you think the, the read-write web technologies could transform the educational experience of students in this country? Well, I think, you know, it, it's hard to, to capture it in, in one very clear vision, obviously. But I think I see different parts of it that, that I think are fairly clear to me, at least. Um, I think the, the classroom walls have to be pretty much just uh, not obliterated physically, but mentally. I mean, we have to get beyond the, the building. Uh, it, learning does not need or require physical space any longer to take place. So. Uh, you know, we can do a lot of, of learning in virtual space, and I think that more and more of what we're going to have to do uh, to reach, a, 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 I think, a, a more effective learning um, vision or, or learning environment for kids is to let go a lot of of a lot of the, uh, the in the four walls practice and and thinking that we do, 
and to make it more uh, more collaborative and more global. I think you know David Warlick had a great line in a blog post. Uh, I think it was yesterday, in fact, where he said something along the lines of, you know, people um, start or keep talking about how we have to we have to uh, react to this growing competitive these growing competitive forces out there in the world that are are you know risk run we run the risk of our kids falling behind but really it's not competition as much as it is collaboration absolutely you know these are collaborative forces i think um and it's a much different way of looking at them and a much more positive way of looking at them i think that our kids have to do work with real audiences for real purposes and <clears throat> that if we're going to continue just you know to pass paper back and forth between the teacher and the student that that is going to be something that's going to leave our kids behind. Um, so, so somewhere down the road, this has to be a, an environment that allows us to, as Marco again, Marco Torres, who's another you know educator who who speaks a lot and and writes a lot about this stuff. But you know, we're, we're student work has to have wings. It has to have a purpose beyond our classroom. I think that's number one. Number two, to me. Um, this is a huge opportunity, I think, to truly make education a community event, a community uh, process. Um, you know, we talk a lot about the fact that we can connect to people around the world using these technologies, but we can also connect to people right down the street using these technologies that in, in many ways we've never made a part of the equation before. And <clears throat> that there's a lot of learning that we can do uh, in our own community that can be facilitated by by uh, this type of, you know, these types of environments. I think the one that I've seen that I think is just amazing is the One Cleveland Initiative, which I'm not sure that you've heard of or is, has really gotten a lot of of uh, notoriety. But um, basically, what they've tried to do in Cleveland is uh, provide access, which is crucial, um, so that schools and hospitals and businesses and and uh, you know everybody within the community can start to interact. Uh, they're not necessarily going across the world to have a uh, video conference. They're just going right down the street to the local hospital where the doctors are answering kids' questions as they, the kids are watching surgery being performed. So um, there's, there's just a lot of opportunities, I think, to make connections into, into the community, um, physical community, uh, that uh, I think can enhance what we do in the classroom as well. And I think that's got to be a part of it. Um, and I, I think you know, there's there's other pieces of this too. But I think the other one that's that's huge is our our teacher preparation program and the way that we prepare teachers for the classroom has to be totally, uh, well, not totally, but has to be re envisioned without question. I mean, um, we can't keep producing teachers uh, who are are you know being prepared based on this this old paradigm that you know what happens in the classroom is basically the most important aspect of learning the face to face stuff that teachers have to do and the relationships that they create with kids are are extremely important and they always will be but teachers have to be much more willing i think to be connectors to be people who kind of let go of the uh the expert in in the front of the room um you know vision and and be learners. We need to have teachers in the classroom who are learners and who are learning as they as they teach with kids and who are learning from kids and teaching kids how to learn and you know it, much less content oriented and much more continual learning oriented because um, you know content is changing very quickly, uh, ideas are changing, technologies are changing. It's just going to be so much more important that we have kids who know how to learn, who are flexible and creative, um, than it is kids who can, you know, uh, spew out answers to test questions. So um, there's a lot that has to change, and uh, I think the reason I say it has to change is because I, I I just really believe that if we, as a public school system, don't start drastically rethinking what we do. Uh, there are going to be many, many alternatives for kids that are going to be cropping up in the next five to ten years that are going to allow them to opt out of public school and public school education as we know it, except, of course, for the kids who can't afford to do that. 
Um, and, and that is just going to present a huge, huge problem um, that uh, uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm not sure how that works out, but I'm, I am sure that if we get to that point, that, that that's not going to be good for any of us. Um, so uh, there's a lot of work that, that I think needs to be done. And again, you know, I, look, I, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm the, uh, you know, the all-knowing expert on school reform. I'm absolutely not. You know, I'm, I'm a 23-year public school educator who, who happens to have, a, have had a, a pretty powerful experience with these tools, who, who comes at this conversation from the context of the changes that have happened in my own life. Now, how those trickle down into systemic change in schools obviously is not as simple as as what's happened to me. But uh, you know, I just come at it knowing that my my own learning looks nothing like what's happening in classrooms, and that technologies are going to continue to foster social collaborative connections in ways that schools are going to have to embrace, or I just don't think they're going to be relevant. I listened to a really interesting podcast yesterday with John Seeley Brown, and he mentioned that um, we've sort of been operating under the same um, assumption that David Warlick mentioned, or you mentioned that David had posted about, that the world is competitive. And he talked about the degree to which Detroit has has really lost the automotive battle because uh, the the Asian companies who are producing cars are so highly cooperative, whereas right. uh, in Detroit they see the relationship between the auto manufacturer and the supplier as, as very competitive and, and private. Right. Um, yeah. I guess what's intriguing to me about all of this is that these changes are happening so fast, and if I were a school administrator, I, I'd be feeling a little bit like the train was was moving at such a speed that it was a little out of control. I wouldn't know what to do. You know, how do you how do you train teachers for my generation my space generation kids when these technologies change even monthly? Well <clears throat> and I, I again I think that, that goes back to you you have to give them opportunities to uh to to really learn how to learn to be flexible, creative learners that, um, you know, again, sitting back and having them sit in rows and sit back and learn a prescribed content and then test out on that content only to forget it the, the week after the test is not something that is going to serve them well in a rapidly changing, you know, uh, quick, a dynamic world like what we are living in. And, and, and imagine what it's going to be like for those kids. I mean, uh, you know, Carl Fish, who writes the Fishbowl blog, I love this phrase, but, you know, next year's kindergartners are the class of 2020. And you're right, administrators really have to have a, a vision, a 2020 vision for for what their future is going to be like because um, it is going to be much different. But we have no idea what that future looks like. We don't even know what the future is going to look like necessarily, you know, five years from now, ten years from now. So the only thing we can do is prepare our kids to be ready for anything, um, you know, and and to me that says, well, they need to know how to build their own learning communities. They need to know how to find their own trusted sources of information. They need to know how to network their ideas. They need to know how to manipulate the tools, uh, how to publish, how to become clickable. Um, you know, they need to know how to make good decisions about all of those things. They need to be creative. They need to to uh, look at every situation critically and and think about it, uh, you know, with with fresh eyes and and not be just taught that one way is the right way. You, you know what I'm saying. And and so, um, I I totally understand that people are feeling overwhelmed. I feel overwhelmed, absolutely. Um, but I think I've gotten to the point where I look at new things and I go, oh, that's an opportunity. How does how can this work? Every, I mean, I read TechCrunch. TechCrunch is one of the blogs that I look at, and it's the blog that probably overwhelms me more than any other, because it's the one that you know is pretty consistently coming out with the new tools that are out there for Web 2.0 and 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 how they might be, uh, you know, put into practice. And and pretty much I always go, well, how can we use that in the classroom? How could that work in the classroom? What what might we be able to do with that? Um, 
and and I, I I think I've gotten to a point where I look at that stuff as, like I said, an opportunity to learn something new. So uh, change is inevitable, and uh, uh, change is just something that uh, you know we're going to have to uh, going to have to come to terms with from here. Oh, well, we always have to come to terms with change, but um, change, especially now, is going to be something that we we have to be responsive to, and we have to teach our kids to to uh, deal with it, to learn from it, and to actually, as much as possible, um, you know, get something out of it, to, to leverage it. I'm interested in the sort of what, a, what to me seems like kind of a, a, a background implication of this is giving the teacher in the classroom more latitude. Um, well, yeah, you know, I, I mean, I actually, I just finished a book last night uh, reading a book called Building Engaged Schools by Gary Gordon. It's not, it's, it just came out, um, and uh, it's a lot of Gallup uh, polling and research. But, you know, one of the things that they say in there that I, that I think is, that really resonates with me, at least, is that, you know, engagement comes when you are, are focusing on your strengths and when you are allowed to run with your strengths. Uh, too much of what we're doing in classrooms right now is remediation of some type to try to get kids weaknesses, you know, to strengthen their weaknesses instead of really celebrating and, and nurturing their strengths and their talents. And I think it's the same thing, you know, in the classroom with teachers, too. I think we have to be willing to look at teachers and say, you know, uh, you know what are their talents? What, what, uh, how can we use their talents? Where can we put them in environments that will maximize um, uh, their potential with, with students? Um, you know, I mean, if, if I was hiring teachers today, I think I would be looking for a much, much different type of person than I would have looked for even, you know, five, ten years ago. And I served on a lot of teacher hiring committees at my school. Um, but the first thing I would be looking for these days is, is there evidence that this particular candidate is a learner? You know, and, and how does this person learn? And what what are the passions and the pursuits that really exemplify this this person's ability to learn and to stay current and to be flexible um, and and you know how can that can that person um, uh, model that in the classroom can can that person really be a teacher by what she does or what he does rather than what he or she says you know um, and, and I, I, it's not about being a content expert as much anymore um, it is about being able to make connections. It's about being able to support students in their own pursuits and their own passions in the context of whatever it is that we're teaching, obviously. But, uh, you know, it, it's, a, I think, a much different uh, environment. And, and uh, um, I think teaching is definitely changing. Um, and it's going to take a different type of teacher to be successful in the classroom from what it's taken uh, the past, you know, 80 years or whatever, however long we've been doing this. Will, I really want to thank you for taking the time to talk uh, with me today. Was there anything that you wanted to express or communicate that we didn't get to? No, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity, Steve. I just, you know, you're doing some really great stuff. I know we talk a lot, but uh, you know, I just want to again thank you for the work that you're doing because uh, it certainly is is uh, making a difference. You've been teaching me a lot of stuff, obviously, and I know there's a lot of other people out there who are benefiting from <clears throat> the work you're doing. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk today. It's been great. Have a great new year, and uh, we'll we'll talk again soon. I'm sure. Thanks, Will.